Thank you very much, Dr. Tongzangir, for your excellent greeting remarks. Um, now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Ungi Kim, a PhD in sociology from the University of Toronto. He's a professor in the Division of International Studies at Korea University. He currently serves as the chair of Korean Studies in the Graduate School of International Studies and as the director of the Canadian Studies Center at Korea University. He is also the president of the Korean Association for Canadian Studies. He has been a visiting professor at UC Berkeley, Akita International University in Japan, and the University of Calgary in Canada. His primary research interests are ethnic studies, culture, religion, social change, and comparative sociology. May I present Dr. Kim? Thank you, Professor uh, Ising Mi, uh, for your uh, introduction. Um, I'm very honored to be uh, a speaker for the very distinguished uh, lecture series. Uh, and as you can see, the topic of my talk uh, is the Christi Christianization of uh, South Korea. Uh, and I hope uh, you have uh, some interest uh, in the way uh, this new religion uh, has become a, a huge success uh, in, in Korea. Um, um, I usually have a more tidy looking face, but uh, somehow the beard has uh, grown a bit, although I shaved this morning, so it must be because I'm rather excited to be speaking in front of uh, such uh, distinguished uh, guests. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to uh, first show you the uh, presentation outline. So first, uh, sort of an introduction as to uh, how Christianity is being sort of uh, played out uh, in Korean society. So it will be like an introduction as to the nature of uh, Christianity uh, in Korea. And then I get right into uh, religious factors that facilitated the rapid growth of Christianity uh, in Korea. And then I discuss uh, non-religious factors, meaning social factors cultural factors that uh, made the Christian success in Korea uh, possible. Uh, just, I, just maybe, I just thought that maybe uh, if there's a quote that is relevant to our life, I thought this would be it. Um, anyway, uh, I think if you um, have walked around Seoul uh, at night, uh, any district I'm sure you've seen uh, a countless number of neon crosses. Uh, and that does give the impression that Korea is a Christian country. Um, when my daughter was growing up and she was learning alphabets, she was impressed by all these neon crosses. And uh, she asked me, uh, Daddy, what are all those small t's? So she didn't, didn't know that it was uh, neon cross, but you know, small T alphabet, right? Um, so anyway, that was sort of a uh, sort of an icebreaker. Uh, and uh, anyway, I think uh, what's uh, impressive about uh, sort of a religious landscape uh, in Korea is that uh, basically three religions dominate. Uh, and that is, if you were to uh, sort of di divide or distinguish uh, Protestant Christianity from Catholicism. So, according to the 2005 census, and that is our latest census, Buddhism is the largest religion with nearly 11 million uh, followers, followed by Protestant Christianity with about 8.7 million, and Catholicism with uh, 5.1 million. So if you can see this table, uh, you can see how the Buddhist religion, Buddhism is, is the largest religion, followed by Protestantism, 
Catholicism, and so on. And what's also very striking about this uh, uh, data is the proportion of Koreans without any religious affiliation. So it's a topic that I'm sure we'll uh, pursue uh, to, to do research as to why there are so many Koreans uh, who are not you know, affiliated, affiliated with any religion. But that's not going to be something that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but in comparison, uh, world average is about 20%. So uh, again, this is a very interesting uh, sociological phenomenon. So what you see here is that uh, from 1995 to 2005, there was an actual decrease uh, in the proportion, or even in actual number, there has been a decrease in the number of uh, Protestant followers. So uh, when the census for 2005 was released, there were many uh, devout uh, Protestants who cried foul that there must be something wrong with the data collection. Because they just couldn't believe that this was happening. But uh, sociologists have gained this uh, understanding that uh, the, the rapidly growing uh, Protestant Christianity did reach a plateau uh, starting in the, the early 1990s. So this uh, definitely shows that. And it will be very interesting to, to see what we have for 2010. And it will be another two, three years before we have uh, results from 2010 uh, data. Uh, another noticeable uh, thing from uh, the, these two uh, sort of a sets of data are that the, the Catholic Church has seen a, a huge increase uh, in, the, in, the, in that time period. So uh, I guess that's there will be another uh, topic for research as to why out of all these religions, major religions, only Catholicism was able to experience uh, this very noticeable growth. Okay? So, uh, turning to uh, Protestantism, uh, it was introduced in uh, 1884, and again, it is now the second largest religion in Korea. Uh, and the growth of uh, Korean Protestantism has been particularly pronounced from the early 1960s to the end of the 1980s, the period of the country's remarkable modernization and industrialization. Uh, so, since the early 1960s, when Korean Protestants barely topped the one million mark, the number uh, increased faster than in any other country, more than doubling every decade until the end of the 1980s. So as you can see in this uh, table, there was only a, a half a million uh, Protestants uh, in 1950, but from that point on, every decade uh, from 1960, more than doubling. Uh, practically, right? Uh, so, uh, from 1960 to 1970, a uh, huge uh, increase. Uh, although I don't talk about this uh, in my presentation today, uh, I think one thing, one sort of a non-religious factor that we could uh, easily include is the Korean War. Uh, and how, uh, after uh, the war was over, uh, it was the missionary bodies that, or sort of the agencies, that handed out uh, relief uh, goods, and that, that's when all you know uh, a lot of missionaries returned to Korea to uh, evangelize. Um, so, Korean Protestantism. I think when foreigners or scholars in, uh, outside of Korea are asked to identify certain things about Korea that that are striking. Uh, this fact is often mentioned, this rapid growth of uh, Christianity. Uh, I think, but little known fact is how there are so many uh, big churches in Korea. I'm not talking about big buildings, but churches with big congregations. Uh, so, five of the ten largest churches in the world are in Seoul. Uh, it has a nickname, uh, City of Churches. It is also reported that 23 of the 50 largest churches are in Korea. So um, I think 
So there's a thing about Koreans uh, who like things big, you know, uh, big houses, big churches, uh, large uh, congregations. Uh, so South Korea currently boasts the world's largest congregation, the Yeouido Full Gospel Church. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Also the world's largest pres Presbyterian, Baptist, and Methodist congregations. Uh, Yeouido Full Gospel Church uh, supposedly has uh, about 700,000 uh, church members. And if you're interested in sort of uh, observing things that are really uniquely Korean, one of the places you should def definitely visit is uh, Yeouido Full Gospel Church. And it does off offer uh, translations in eight languages of the, the service. Korea has the world's largest and second largest Presbyterian, Presbyterian churches, uh, Yongnak Presbyterian Church, uh, Chunhyun Presbyterian Church. Uh, also, Korea also has the world's largest and second largest Methodist uh, churches, Gwangnim, uh, Gumnan, and world's largest Baptist church. I think the list can go on, but uh, maybe I should uh, stop there. Uh, but, but this is interesting. Uh, when it comes to uh, all the Protestant Christians, which denominations do they belong to? And the largest one is Presbyterian, followed by Methodist, Holiness, Baptist, and Full Gospel. And about 10% of the total uh, number of uh, Protestant churches uh, comprises uh, independent churches. Uh, another unique aspect of uh, Protestant church in Korea is that many of the uh, religious activities and practices sort of uh, uh, hinge on uh, what can be termed um, um, what's the term that I'm looking for? Um, Pentecostal. Uh, belief in faith healing uh, and also speak, speaking in tongue. Uh, those are in uh, mainline Protestant churches in the United States and uh, Europe, they're strictly Pentecostal. But in Korea, those activities can be seen in all of these churches. So there's no real clear division between Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal churches in Korea. So uh, that's uh, sort of an interesting Yes, so uh, Pentecostal Christianity is uh, marked by its emphasis on the literal translation or interpretation of the Bible, uh, faith healing, that's uh, uh, healing the sick uh, through sort of God's intervention, uh, and also uh, speaking in tongue, meaning uh, sort of the, the Christians falling into some, some kind of ecstasy, <coughs> and speaking in language that is not uh, coherent, not understandable, but that is possible because they're directly in communication with God. So these are emphasized in Pentecostal churches, only uh, in the United States and, and in Europe, but in Korea, those aspects are practiced in all these uh, denominations. Uh, so. There's a so the so, so the line between Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal denominations in Korea is blurred, uh, and that's because uh, of the the influence of shamanism uh, in Korea. Because shamanism practices uh, what can be uh, termed faith healing, because shamans do supposedly uh, heal the sick uh, and also. Uh, they emphasize uh, sort of an ecstatic experience, sort of an indirect communication with, uh, with spirits. Uh, and also, Korean Protestantism is notable in another respect, um, and that is that they're very enthusiastic when it comes to uh, religious uh, activities. So, uh, you know, surveys have shown that when it comes to engaging in religious activities, Koreans, definitely like number one. Again, international comparisons show that uh, more Korean Christians go to church uh, on a more regular basis. They read the Bible more often. They pray more often uh, than most other Christians uh, in the world. 
uh, and they also emphasize tithing, uh, which is to say that you pay 10% of your uh, income uh, to your church. And uh, unlike North America and Europe, where there is a wide gap between the number of people who identify themselves as Christians uh, and you know, how the frequency of their church attendance, uh, that gap is much smaller for Korean Christians. Okay? So here are uh, actual data. According to recent surveys in the, in the USA, about 76 to 83% of Americans identify themselves as Christian, but only about 40% are found to attend services on a weekly basis or more. But for Koreans, two-thirds. They identif identify themselves as Christians, and two-thirds go to church more or less on a weekly basis. And another sort of uh, interesting fact is now how Korea sends more missionaries abroad than most other countries. Uh, as of 2003, Korea had 12,000 missionaries in more than 160 countries, second only to the USA, which had 46,000 missionaries worldwide. Britain was third with 6,000 missionaries. As of 2008, the number of Korean overseas missionaries nearly 20,000 in 168 countries uh, and you know we're talking about a country that had that is that has only a, a, a sort of a century year old century old history of this new religion and yet it is now number two missionary sending country in the world and that's you know if you compare it with number three it's quite more right so I think, you know, given the, the, the zeal of Korean uh, Christians, it is not, I don't think, impossible for Korea to overtake the USA in the next uh, couple of decades uh, in terms of the, the number of uh, missionaries uh, sent overseas. So there is indeed a grain of truth in the saying that wherever Koreans go, they start a church. And this is very true, not only in Korea, but also in overseas uh, Korean communities. There are so many churches. And I hope uh, I, I don't sort of sound racist there, because as an Asian, I think <laughs> I'm sort of more free to say this. Um, and I put this in to uh, make you uh, sort of chuckle. <laughs> uh, when the Chinese arrived in the place, they opened a restaurant. Uh, the Japanese, Islam is a factory, Koreans a church. Uh, sort of uh, light, uh, funny thing. Uh, and a little bit about Catholicism before I get right into the, the factors that account for the rise of Christianity uh, in Korea. Uh, Catholicism was actually, it was introduced to Korea exactly 100 years before the arrival of uh, Protestant Christianity which is to say, 1784. So Protestant Christianity was introduced to Korea in 1884, Catholicism, 1784. Uh, and it was uh, severely persecuted, uh, during which 10,000, that's sort of exaggeration, about 8,000 Catholics were martyred. Uh, and um, one sort of uh, interesting story about the, the, the this large number of martyrs we have is that when Pope John Paul uh, II visited Korea in 1984 uh, in celebration of the bicentennial uh, sort of introduction of uh, Catholicism, 107 uh, martyrs were canonized. They became saints. Uh, and Korea now has fourth largest number of saints in the world. So that's another big thing, right? A country with only 200 year uh, old history of this new religion, and yet so many saints. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, 103. <laughs> Excuse my uh, uh, sort of mistake with the number. Uh, so, together, Protestant and Catholic Christians comprise roughly 30% of the population. Um, and Christianity as a whole is the largest religion. Uh, and um, 
I think this uh, sort of uh, the Christian's, Christian success in Korea, or should I say the Seoul uh, Christian success in Korea in comparison to its neighboring countries like Japan and, and China, uh, does show that this is something that is really, really uh, interesting and, and unique that sort of uh, deserves uh, a lot of uh, uh, scholarly attention. Uh, for comparison, uh, Korea, in Korea, uh, we're talking about 30% of the population, about 13 million Koreans who are Christian. In Japan, okay, 13 million out of 49 million total population. Japanese total population is 125 million. So roughly 2.5 times larger than that of Korea. And yet, the total number of Christians in Japan is half a million. So, uh, J Japan, I mean, if you look closely, it's different from Korea. But, in all, but also at the same time, in many respects, uh, Japan does share a lot of cultural similarities with Korea. So, uh, when I talk about the Korean case, and if it is pertinent, I'll bring in the Japanese uh, case to shed some light on the differences between the, the two countries uh, in terms of their experience with uh, this uh, new religion. So the question is, uh, what are the, the factors that facilitated this tremendous growth of Christianity uh, in Korea, particularly that of Protestantism? And there are both religious and non-religious factors. So first, uh, religious factors, and I think if anybody asks me, because I, I do get asked that often uh, since I do study this, what is the number one reason why Korea has become a Christian country? I always refer to this. Okay? And here are, here is the reason why. Uh, when the Protestant missionaries first arrived in uh, 1884, uh, Korea did not have any strong religious presence of any kind. Uh, Buddhism at the time was thoroughly suppressed by the Joseon government because uh, actually every other religion other than Confucianism was banned, especially Buddhism. So the monks were kicked out of uh, the capital and other urban centers. All the uh, uh, temples were banished to the mountainside. Uh, and people were simply not allowed to practice Buddhism. So Buddhism was, let's say, dead. Uh, and I think one religion that Koreans did practice, at least in secrecy, uh, was shamanism. But shamanism has no organized priesthood. It has no uh, sort of a regularized sort of a religious service. <laughs> Only when uh, ill fortunes strike uh, families, uh, shamans were called in to perform good uh, sh ritual. Uh, so it didn't really have any sort of organized presence that could oppose this new religion. Uh, what about Confucianism? Uh, as you know, Confucianism was more sort of a felt and practiced as a set of social ethics, uh, moral ethics, or uh, sort, of, sort of norms that sort of uh, guided uh, how people should behave uh, in social settings. So the only religious element in Confucianism was ancestor worship. And that too was only practiced from time to time, you know, during uh, uh, significant cultural holidays like the new, uh, Lunar New Year's Day or Korean Thanksgiving. So, so as you can see from these uh, uh, sort of uh, words of these early missionaries, they said things like, you know, it looks like you know, city like Seoul is practically practically without a religion, okay? and there's not a temple of any kind. And Greece, I mean, although monks were banned from uh, cities, they did come in 
uh, in secrecy, uh, as you can see there. And uh, Griffith uh, in 1888 also said, uh, to quote, uh, Koreans offer the spectacle of a nation without a religion and waiting for one. And Isabella Bird uh, and her account of Korea is a classic uh, account uh, from that period. Um, so she said, to quote, when Buddhist priests and temples were prohibited in the walled towns, anything like a, a national faith uh, disappeared from Korea. So I think uh, when a new religion uh, is introduced, what is important is whether there is a, a fertile ground for this new religion to uh, take root. And that fertile ground uh, is determined <coughs> by whether the, 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 the traditional existing religions have a strong presence. So uh, to give you a, a sense of what I'm trying to say, if you look at uh, any country where Christianity has penetrated, one common denominator is that all these countries do not have a strong presence of major religion. So, if you look at Africa, you know, where uh, Christianity is, is one of the, uh, I, mean, Christ I mean, Christianity and Islam are two of the biggest religions, actually they are the two largest religions in Africa. So how are they able to penetrate? Because African countries practiced, before the arrival of the missionaries and the colonizers, they practiced tribal religion, uh, folk religion, uh, and what amounts to shamanism. So when these missionaries came, they were not faced with any resistance. Because there was no religious organized priesthood, there was no organized uh, sort of a church, sort of a structure uh, to fight against. But if you look at countries like the countries in the Middle East, India, all the Christian efforts failed miserably. Why? Because they had established religion. So the, the new religion simply could not penetrate. So. If you look at Korea, and Japan too, Shinto, it's a pseudo uh, state religion. At least that's it. What it, that's what it was when uh, Christianity was introduced. Uh, and also, uh, Buddhism was a, a very strong religion when the, the, the when Christianity was introduced. So Christianity just failed. They just couldn't penetrate uh, past the the existing. <coughs> traditional religions. Yeah, it's China too. Uh, sort of stronghold of tr traditional religions like Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and uh, also uh, Christianity there failed. So uh, what about Korea? As I explained to you before, uh, earlier, uh, when the missionaries arrived, we didn't have a strong established religion, traditional religion, that could have uh, put up a fight or an opposition against this re new religion. So the, the theory goes that new religions appear constantly in all societies, but their successes are contingent upon opportunity. That is, new religions become successful against long established established religions only when the latter fail to serve the needs of the people or are organizationally too weak to put up any kind of opposition. So I came to this conclusion when I did this uh, comparative uh, study of uh, Christianity in Korea uh, versus Christianity in Japan. And that was the only difference between Korea and Japan. And that was a huge, huge difference. Okay, so the, that's the first uh, sort of a factor uh, in the religious sort of a, a part. 
The second uh, religious factor that facilitated uh, the rapid growth of Christianity in Korea is the affinity between Korean religious culture and Protestantism. And when I talk about this, I'm not just talking about the innate uh, affinity, but more about how certain elements of each sort of uh, aspect were emphasized by Korean pastors. Uh, so for example, um, one of the sort of uh, biggest reasons why uh, Protestant Christianity became so successful is that uh, if you look at sort of the sermons, if you listen to sermons, if you look at the publications that have collected all the sermons by major uh, pastors, one thing that is noticeable is that there is this theme, uh, sort of this worldly wish fulfillment that that is pronounced uh, in the sermons of Korean pastors. So what this means is that you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, and then in return, uh, Jesus Christ or God returns favor by granting the believer uh, earthly wishes. So, uh, so don't think that this is uniquely Korean because uh, the, the growing success of Protestant church in South America is pretty much based on this. And also if you look at uh, Christianity in Africa, there is uh, much emphasis on uh, earthly uh, wish fulfillment. Uh, but the unique uh, thing about Korea is that this is based on Koreans' attachment to shamanism. Um, so, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with shamanism, but basically uh, shamanism believes that everything in life, living or dead, has spirit. And that these spirits exert influence upon one's fate. So if something goes bad, it, is, it, it, it didn't happen because you know, life has all these uh, quirks and all these unexpected events. It happened because uh, an evil spirit, it may be an evil spirit of the house or ancestors or whatever. So uh, because of that belief, when something, uh, so if uh, ill fortune uh, struck a family, then again, I'm talking about the old days, right? The thing to do was to bring in uh, a shaman and to do a, a ritual uh, to chase away evil spirits. So, so what the religion ultimately promises to believers is this worldly wish fulfillment. Because uh, shamanism is uh, not the other worldly religion, like Christianity. You know, Christianity is about salvation, eternal life, next life. But shamanism is about this life. So what, can, what this religion can promise are things like health, uh, prosperity, and longevity. Right? So these elements of shamanism, which are so dear to Koreans, are emphasized by Korean pastors too. Yeah. And, and again, when I say this, uh, I hope you don't think that this is uniquely Korean, but I'm adding that there is this shamanistic element to this. Uh, and then the, the second uh, part is, is the same. Uh, and um, I don't know if I want to really talk about this, but uh, the practice of faith healing, uh, which is you know, widely practiced in, in many uh, churches, uh, of course, also has a, a similar uh, counterpart uh, in, in shamanism. So, uh, and so, so the, the when I talk about the affinities, I'm talking about on, on one one hand affinity between Christianity and shamanism, and uh, on the other hand affinity between uh, Christianity and Confucianism. So. 
so things like when it comes to you know the matter of uh, practical morality and ethics, what Confucianism emphasized found parallels in Christianity. So, uh, for example, uh, the fifth commandment. You know how filial piety is one of the uh, core uh, sort of principles of Korean norms and values, and for the for uh, uh, the Korean pastors, they had they had no problem how saying how you know the fifth commandment of uh, the, the, the the ten commandments is the same thing as the the emphasis on filial piety uh, of uh, Confucianism. Okay, and also the lesson on obedience to one's parents has been a salient theme of sermons and Sunday school uh, programs uh, in South Korea. So also the ideal of the subordination of wife to husband. Maybe this is sort of outdated now. <laughs> uh, but at least in the early uh, phase of uh, Christian uh, expansion, this was definitely true. So. Uh, Again, I think this is definitely outdated as of like now, hopefully. <laughs> um, so, what all of these points of contact uh, demonstrate is that Christianity did not contradict or deny much that the populace had embraced in its old beliefs. So, as uh, Samuel Moffat wrote, quote, uh, like Confucianism, it taught righteousness and revered learning. Like Buddhism, it sought purity and promised a future life. Like the shamanist, Christian believed it answered prayer and miracles. So there was no real clash uh, of values between the new doctrine and the existing religion, religions of Korea. And that was made possible largely through the efforts of Korean pastors. And in their efforts to win new converts, Korean pastors actually shaped Christianity in accordance with the trade tradition bound religious inclination of Koreans. So um, and this I'm going back to the, the the my argument about the affinity between uh, Christianity and shamanism. And again I hope you don't have a, a, a develop any misunderstanding about shamanism. Um, because when scholars uh, in Korea are asked to identify traditions that have shaped the psyche of Koreans, the mental landscape, uh, they usually refer to shamanism and Confucianism. So uh, shamanism is a, uh, is a core uh, value of, of, of Koreans and that is why the way Christianity is practiced at many churches. So I think this is a good point where I need to qualify some of the things I've said, meaning things I've said about this affinity between uh, sort of uh, shamanistic sort of uh, uh, values and uh, Christianity uh, should not be universally applied to all the churches. But this is sort of a uh, major trend or the major sort of a manifestation of how Christianity is practiced by uh, a large majority of Christians in Korea. So uh, I told you how uh, the Yoido Full Gospel Church is the largest church in the world and the uh, uh, evangelical slogan, uh, maybe that's not the perfect uh, phrasing, but sort of a message that has attracted large audiences and inspired other churches to emulate is the threefold blessings of Christ. Uh, so, this theology of prosperity is, is, is a very famous uh, theology now. Uh, sort of advances the idea that accepting Jesus Christ as a as your Savior uh, will bless you with three things health prosperity and salvation so you know how in a sort of a purely 
uh, Christian understanding, what you get by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is salvation only, right? But in the case of the Yoidofu Gospel Church, you get two more health and prosperity. So I think with that belief, you know, you have everything. So what's their, I mean, is there any reason not to, not, you know, is, I don't, I mean, if one is thinking about, uh, or if one is interested in Christianity, I think the, these messages uh, can easily be uh, very, very attractive uh, in, in turning uh, potential converts uh, to uh, become, to actually become uh, Christians. So, uh, just the current case is consistent with the existing cross-cultural studies on Christian conversion, that Christianity has shown great success in propagating itself by incorporating different cultural traits in local setting, settings. So this challenges the view that conversion entails changes in the beliefs and values. I think the current case is an important uh, sort of a, a case that shows these aspects. Okay, so now I don't know how I'm doing on time, but so I started at sorry. How much time do I have? <laughs> oh, ten minutes. <laughs> Okay, so to give ourselves uh, for some time for uh, Q&A, I'm going to just make this very uh, brief. Uh, so non-religious factors in conversion, what I try to show is how in the beginning, when uh, Christianity was first introduced uh, in 1884, uh, Korea was mired in, in a very delicate sort of international uh, sort of uh, climate where uh, Russia, China, uh, Japan, all vied, vied for uh, control of Korea. So, in sensing this, the, the chosen court uh, wanted to uh, befriend Western powers, because at the time, it was believed that Western powers did not have any sort of imperial designs or you know, interests uh, in the region. So that's why Korea signed a series of treaties with Western powers starting with the United States in 18, 1882. So although the official line was still anti-Christian because uh, because of the, the sort of a century old persecutions against Catholicism, so sort of the anti-Christianity was still the sort of the, the the trend. So officially anti-Christian measures were still there, but in reality the court sort of looked the other way. It allowed missionaries to do their things, to set up schools, to uh, proselytize among Koreans. So, um, so you know how, uh, if you look at uh, uh, Japan and, and, and China, uh, these countries, when Christianity was intu introduced, uh, generally speaking, uh, as a whole, they were hostile to uh, Christianity and the missionaries. But in the case of Korea, uh, it wasn't the case because of the, the international circumstances uh, surrounding uh, South Korea. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we could easily talk about the, the, the Korean War and its impact uh, on, on, on Koreans. So I think it could easily be the second uh, or third uh, sort of a non-religious factor that uh, facil facilitated the, uh, the widespread expansion of uh, Christianity. The second non-religious religious factor that I uh, talk about is the missionaries' involvement with social services. Uh, they were uh, the first to uh, offer modern school uh, uh, education for girls and boys, 
established the country's first complete system of education from kindergarten to college, start the first school for the blind, uh, offer medical treatments, um, founded the first modern hospital, and the list goes on. Now, another interesting thing about this is that in Japan, they did the same thing. Actually, whenever the Western missionaries went, they did all this. You know, find, founding schools, uh, offering medical treatments, uh, and uh, making available uh, modern medicine. So, so the, the question is, when the missionaries do the same things wherever they go, why is it only certain countries where miss, uh, missionaries succeed? And that is why that brings, back, brings us back to the first one, the religious void. So let's, uh, I hope you could keep that in mind. The last uh, non-religious factor that I talk about is the, the rapid social change you know, in the 1960s on, from the 1960s on, uh, Korea went through very, very rapid uh, industrialization and urbanization, and this is when millions of Koreans were uprooted, and they had to work, you know, they had to go to the, the, to the, to the cities, where things were very impersonal. Uh, there were, so, uh, so, so many Koreans went to church uh, to get a sense of community, to get a sense of identity, a uh, sense of belonging, and churches were the only institutions that offered sort of a, sort of a, uh, settings where people could socialize, uh, you know, sort of uh, form networks, and uh, to again develop uh, a sense of uh, identity and, and belonging. So uh, I'm sorry that I rushed through the, the second half. But I wanted to uh, give you some time to uh, raise questions and for me to respond. So, please. First, maybe we should applaud for you.